now. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce to all of you, or to reintroduce, if you've met him before, <laughs> Mr. David Lucas. So first, I want to tell you a little bit about David Lucas. Um, I think of uh, David as as my go-to naturalist. He is the uh, in in Encyclopedia Lucatanica. Um, he has um, a voracious appetite for um, all things cool and natural, and his memory holds lots of information. But in addition to that, he is somebody who makes mental connections. So anytime you go out in the field with him, um, like like it's it's not like you know if you pulled up the Wikipedia page on a plant, he sort of helps you see relationships and things. He's got a deep ecological understanding. Um, and is a um, autodidact. Um, he's uh, done deep dives into uh, language, words, published author um, of, uh, of several books. And I've had the privilege of being in the field with him on many occasions. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has, he does, he does wonder and curiosity like a boss. <laughs> and um, so um, if you want to get a little slice of um, kind of uh, uh, kind of getting to peek into David's brain, um, David uh, often sort of shares ideas in visual forms and also now has a newsletter, a newsletter that is um, just some brilliant writing about nature and um you'll you'll uh if you get on that newsletter you'll get exposed to natural history information on a topic that you thought you knew and then you'll uh read through that and two things will happen one will be like there'll be all this other information that comes in but also as i said david is sort of an idea connector and he'll help you think about things in a different way in a rich way uh, david lucas it is so uh delightful to have you here with us Thank you. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> wow. Uh, I really appreciate that introduction. Yavea, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to see you both and to see some familiar faces uh, in the panel at the side here. And it's it's a pleasure to be here to just chat with both of you and chat with everyone about a favorite flower for all of us, the uh, members of the Astor family. And I have a variety of photographs from my local landscape here, uh, some large scale ones and some close in details. And so we can just go back and forth in the slides. I have about 18, 19 slides. We can just kind of skip back and forth if we want to dive into a detail or look at a larger view to do some drawing. And uh, along the way, we'll just talk about these amazing flowers. So yes. sound good for everyone? I, I think that's a, that's a plan. That's a plan. Let me show uh, the screen here. Excellent. I think this will work. <clears throat> this is we're we're looking out at your backyard right now, right? This is this is yeah. this is the country that you have decided to move to. This is mm -hmm. what part of Washington are you in? This is north central Washington, uh, oh, about thirty miles south of the Canadian border, on the east side of the Cascade Crest. Um, we're looking into North Cascades National Park and the Paceton Wilderness. It's a, a really remarkable, very wild area. My neighbors are wolves and moose and wolverine and lynx. Uh, most of the lynx that are left in Washington are here in my neighborhood. Mm. Uh, we have three wolf yep. packs. Uh, we're surrounded by oh. about three million acres of wilderness, but we're a little finger of agricultural land that sticks into the middle of this vast, vast wilderness. And... Uh, so I'm kind of down here in the valley floor, the lower slopes, the starting in like uh, the, towards the end of April, these asters just go bonkers in this landscape. And then they, they're starting to move up slope now above the valley floor. So these photographs taken from the valley floor during the peak, which was within the last two weeks was the peak of these flowers. Most of what we're seeing here, uh, I'm gonna focus on these uh, arrowleaf balsam roots because they're very large, conspicuous composite. Uh, a couple pictures of some dandelions just for some variation of another common flower that people are familiar with. And then at, at least one shot of arnicas, which are in the forest right now. Um, so we're going to talk about composite flowers and explore those. People are really familiar with these. These are the most successful 
and the most highly advanced family of plants in the world. There might be a little bit of debate about whether there's more orchids or more sunflowers. And the more research you do, the more the numbers vary. So it's kind of hard to say, but really the composites are pretty much the most successful family. There's about 25 to 30,000 species of these flowers in about at least 1,600 genera. One source said there's 1,900 genera. Um, and it's there's going to be a little bit of confusion here in the name. If you started with botany a while ago, you would know composites as a family or compositae. Now they're known as asteraceae. So you could call them asters. You could call them sunflowers. Um, for the purposes of what we're going to do today, I'm just going to call them composites because we're looking at the flowers, but they're also a composite family. Um, and let's see. So I'll be going through these slides, some more quickly, some slower. Stop me at any point if you want to ask questions, uh, look at more details, uh, or like try to spend some time drawing. This is like right in my neighborhood here. So just pose the question like, is this a successful family? When you look at a photo <laughs> like this, what is growing in the landscape? You would have to say that hands down, these sunflowers are incredibly successful. Um, and they create these amazing displays. So they're doing something which uh, their strategy is that they're a generalist flower. They have a broad platform. We'll look at the flowers in more detail, but they have a broad platform, which is easy for a lot of pollinators to come to, a lot of insects to come to. Um, in one study looking at one species- So, of right, so by, by broad, broad, broad platform, you mean that there's sort of a big landing pad? a big landing pad okay. and when we look at the flowers themselves we will see the the big landing pad um as i was going to say in one study they found 178 species of pollinators coming to one species of composite so that's fantastic for the insects it's a place you can come and land and get pollen and nectar they, they produce a lot of pollen and nectar uh, the disadvantage for the composites is that the insects that visit you are not specific to you. They will just go anywhere. Um, and so that's the disadvantage of being a generalist flower is that you attract lots of pollinators, lots of different kinds of pollinators, but they're not loyal to you and they will just fly off to the next flower that looks pretty like this. And because there are so many composites, they're likely to visit a different composite of a different species mm. and your pollen's wasted. But the composites are phenomenally successful because they counteract that tendency by having these kinds of displays, like you see here, just the absolutely flamboyant displays that carpet the landscape. So the chances of a pollinator coming into this field of flowers and then visiting another flower of the same species goes way up because they grow in these masses all over the landscape. Um, so this is the early balsam root. We move into the forest, the coniferous forest, and the forest right now is just carpeted with these arnicas. Um, all over the place. And so they're doing the same thing, but in a different habitat. They're just filling in the spaces of the landscape with large numbers so that if the, if, uh, the uh, pollinator comes to the flower, it's more likely than not to go to another one of the same species. So and we'll look at, uh, now we'll kind of dive in on the flower. And uh, if you want to, I don't know, Jack, if you want to do specific drawing exercises at any point, but um, just stop me if you feel like trying to capture one flower. I don't want to just talk the whole time. Yeah, well, maybe what we'll do is just sort of describe what you're seeing here. And then mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'll do a little breakdown on this about how we might uh, draw um, a flower at this kind of an angle and yeah. and uh, and view. Um, I, at this point, I have two images that are kind of the same, kind of just a, a broad picture of the flower. So this is the other one. So we can pick either one of these two. Um, so. I think everyone here probably already knows that composites are called composite flowers because this single thing that we see functionally as a flower and a pollinator is going to see functionally as a flower is actually composed of many, many flowers inside of a tight cluster. And um, just some technical terminology here. We would call this a flower. It's actually composed of, it's actually a single inflorescence is technically, it's an inflorescence or some botanists have proposed calling it a blossom, but it's composed of many tiny flowers. And technically you're, you're supposed to call the tiny flowers florets. So these are 
of dozens, hundreds even, of little florets making an inflorescence or a blossom. Um, but it's easier, I think, uh, rather than saying floret every time, I'm just going to say flower, and I'll be talking about the individual flowers that make up this larger flower here. Um, and uh, what we're looking at, as I mentioned earlier, is that broad platform here. We see that in both this picture and in this picture, that broad platform at the center. Um, and it's composed of two different kinds of florets. We'll go into more detail on those. The, the ray florets around the perimeter Around the perimeter are the ray florets or ray flowers, and in the center are the disc flowers, which form that tight concentration in the center. And so this is a broad platform for pollinators. And that's important because the vast majority of insects cannot hover and pollinate at the same time. You might think of a, I don't know what, a bee maybe, hovering, uh, buzz pollinating at a flower, maybe butterflies can kind of hover, but most insects, the vast majority of insects do not have the, uh, they're not designed to hover in flight at a complicated flower. They need to land and walk around. And by massing all of your feathers together, what you ensure is that one visitor can walk and visit many small flowers in one visit at a time. And so that's a, an advantage both to the flower and to the pollinator because the pollinator doesn't have to spend energy flying around a lot. It can just stop and visit lots of flowers, have many pollination events in one stop, um, and it's going to stay there longer, which is an advantage to the flower because the longer the pollinator stays, the more opportunities it's going to have to touch each of the flowers as it moves around. So um, that, David, that's, this is kind of a, a, a cool thought. This is a, sort of a good example of sort of mm -hmm. how you can kind of tie things together that I've never thought about. I've never really thought about kind of your, uh, so two things that are, are really re resonating with me. One is this idea that for many uh, insects, the landing platform is essential. And, mm -hmm. and so see, that's, that's a really cool thought. Um, this, the second thing, your idea of kind of getting around the problem of if you are just so general, it's easy for your pollinator to kind of go on to the next thing and the next thing, and maybe that's not you. So right. respond to that by having 9 trillion, bazillion, quadrillion flowers all over the, yeah. the, the, the landscape. Those little pieces, that, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, um let's see what i was going to say about that go ahead should, should, do, should i do a little um how to sketch these bad boys study on this close-up you can do it anytime um did you see i have two of them if you want to choose let's see where's the other one the other one is um two options here they're kind of both showing the same kind of general view any of those either of those better um sure. let's see i'm thinking it might, might be difficult for me to show my screen on all devices mm -hmm. while this is up. I have a photograph of one in a similar pose. Should we bounce over to that? Sure. All right. So we're going to drop out of your screen share and okay. then <clears throat> um, and then I will share. And I'm going to share my desktop. Hi. Um, David, oh, can you see me? Yep, I can see you. All right. And um, then there's some flowers over, I guess, over yep. there. Yep. All right. Um, let's, let's do this. I am. They look like the same flower, almost. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, well, except that out, out here, it's like, oh, one in some sagebrush, and where you are, it's next to just nine trillion more of these. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so it's a little, uh, so uh, maybe we get you to kind of comment on this view that you're seeing here. Yeah, and I have some photos like that, too, that are really oh, you do? good. Okay. Yeah, All right, maybe we can jump to your photos like that later. We'll, we'll bounce past this, and let's just kind of jump to, yep. to, to, to here. Um, so here is sort of a simplified model of this plant. 
And, and, and what I, um, what you want to notice with this is that you've got your center of your flower and then you have your, your, um, the, the central center of your inflorescence. And then each of these florets points towards the center of this flower. Mm -hmm. So very simply, the, um, the simple way to kind of initially block these, these change cameras here. All right. So the first big thought is um, if you're looking at the flower head on, um, all these petals are going to be sort of um, equally distant from that center. So what you what you want to do is to start off just by this outer circle. You draw yourself a big circle lightly. And if you put crosshairs through the middle of that, that gives you the center of your circle and there's your center of your circle. So that um, you're going to have your disc flowers here, your ray flowers out in this zone, and you can get the Di the approximate distances of each of these ray flowers by that outer circle. And what you want to be doing is aiming all of your petals to this point right in the very center. Mm -hmm. um, so if this is one of your petals, all right, or actually one of your ligules, one of your, uh, one of your florets, ray flowers. your ray flowers. It's going to point there. So one that is coming in on, say, this angle, it is pointing right towards the center there. And so everybody, wherever you come in, don't aim your next one like this. It's really kind of easy to do that. You see how this one is now pointing off that center so it doesn't quite work i want to aim any others that come in towards the center here so first give yourself a little line to help you figure out where that goes and then i am going to come in here do your first level of ones that are on the top and then you can start to tuck in others underneath those but also pointing to the center So that's middle as the target is your um, is your sort of initial strategy number one. But this looks works great if the flower is pointing straight towards you. If it's at a slight angle, notice that that circle then becomes an ellipse. So if you're drawing one of these that's on as an ellipse, It's going to be a similar sort of thing, but I'm going to draw crosshairs through the center of it. You can actually put as many lines as you want through this to kind of give yourself guidelines, as long as they all cross through the center. And so if I have flower at an angle, here's going to be its center. And I'm going to have my ray flowers there in the center. Draw the ones that are on the side of that little ray flower bundle with a little bit more detail, a little bit less detail in the background. Here in the background, I'm just going to put in a little outline. And that will kind of give it more of a sense of depth. And now this outer oval shows me the length of each one of these ray flowers. These ones on the side, I'm going to draw them nice uh, and wide, but short. Aww. <laughs> and ones that are coming in at this angle are going to be nice and long but skinny.
And ones that are kind of coming in somewhere in between those will be somewhere somewhere in between those. So maybe not as wide as the other ones, not as skinny. So if I'm coming in here, I'm aiming towards that point. And if there's somebody below them, it comes in here. Now, you'll notice that on the one in the photograph here and the one that photo for the photograph that David just showed, the, the, uh, the little ray flowers that are on this side um, are short, and the ones that are on this side are long. So I have long, 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 short. What's going on there? What's going on there is that this flower is actually a cone shape. Um, its petals are sticking up at an angle. And if you tilt, if you look at, a, at one of these flowers from straight down, you see everything the same length. But the minute you rock it at an angle, then all of a sudden I have the short side and long side, longest side, and long side. So notice that the outside shape is still an oval, but because this is a um, because this is a cone shape and I've tilted it, the center of the flower is no longer in the middle. It's moved closer to this one, this side. So I actually have this side that I'm seeing now. My petals are longer here than I'll see even here on the outside edges. So how does that look? We have an oval. And here is where my target is going to be. So I'm going to put my little other oval, my center there. Mm. And that means I have little petals on this side. I have, and then I'm going to, from this little point down here, I'm going to just draw lines up to the outside edges here. And now when I draw these, here's this pedal is going to be really wide, the full width of the pedal, but super short. Or actually, I should say this flower. Um, this next one over here is these ones are shorter. And as you go around the back, here I'm focusing on kind of getting my, my pedal widths, um, but not I'm not getting as good um, on the details of the tips of these. One last thing, notice on the tips of these, there's often a little jiggle jaggle like this that you're seeing at the tip of it. And that um, has a little interesting story behind it. Yes, I can tell that. Please do. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'll just you work with your riff off of your picture right now, because it's a great one. Um, so the ray flowers that you're focusing on right now, uh, we call it, you use the word legial, which is a great word too. The flower itself is a, um, asymmetric corolla which is greatly elongated so it's asymmetrical and elongated so what would be the right by your left hand that beautiful aster shape the star shape is actually um, deformed so it's just turned into one big giant what you could call petal coming off and it's actually that petal the ray flower is three petals that fuse and greatly elongate 
And because it's three petals that are fused, you it, you often see three little teeth at the tip, like you drew there, and you can kind of kind of piece it together in the diagram. And for the first time, I'm noticing that I wonder if the veins, the three veins, correspond to the the fusion points of the three petals. I've never thought of that before. That's mm. probably what's going on. Um, and what characterizes ray flowers, as opposed to the legal legal flowers, which you kind of referred to is that ray flowers are always female entirely. And I have a, a, a photograph that shows that, the female parts of it. Um, and a legal flower would look the same, but it's bisexual. It's both male and female. Female, mm. And the legal, which looks the same as a ray, but it's slightly different, um, is actually five petals fused. So it's going to have five teeth at the tip. Oh, 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 okay. So you're saying I can look at some of these around here and I'll find some are threes and some are fives? And For different species, not in the same flower. Oh, not in the same flower. So no, it's characteristic of different species because they're different sex. Um, okay, this is so cool. Yeah. So uh, let me just repeat back because I'm just I'm just learning this uh, uh, you, uh, right now. So if I have three little jaggy teeth, mm -hmm. It is, it's a female, female flower. It's There's a not going flower. to be, say again. It's a ray flower. Okay. It's female. So ray yep. is female and is um, three on the tip. And yep. the ligule is male and female and is five on the tip yep it's five petals that are fused and then i will have and so in one species it'll either be all ray flowers or all legules is that right yeah oh i think they're called uh Yvea can chime in i think she put it in the chat ligulate flowers or ligule flower she put uh she put down ray florets versus legule florets so that's i think that's probably proper this is cool. This is yeah. cool. This makes me want to go run around and look at the, um, the tips. Oh, like, so let's say on a dandelion, it's got a bunch of jaggy teeth there. There will be five of them. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I have some dandelion pictures, so we'll look for that. I'm, I think of chicory as one that has ligulate flowers, I believe. Okay. Oh, uh, that's good. You have I may add something. Um, so sort of, and I could be wrong, so please correct me if I am. The way I think about it is that, for example, in the flower that we have here, we've got both ray flowers and disc flowers on the same inflorescence. So that's why you can see the two different types. When we talk about ligulate flowers, that's when they have what appears to be only ray flowers, except that they're not really ray flowers because... <laughs> And so, for example, if you if you look at a dandelion's flowers, then it looks like it's surrounded by only ray flowers because you don't see any of the disc ones. But really, those are the ligulate ones because mm -hmm. not only female, they have both parts. Is that sort of it? Yep, that's it. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, I think in ligulate flowers, they only have the rays, the ligules. Yeah. So that, um, and I think, is it, correct me if I'm wrong, Yvette, uh, isn't the, this ray is technically called a ligule anyway, right? Whether it's three or five, it's a ligule. I, I think that's true. You're, prob you're probably right. I'm not totally sure, but I think you're probably right. Yeah. I mean, we're not in this for the terminology as much as the uh, just drawing it, but. <clears throat> oh, but but the, the terminology is fun because there's there's a whole level of like nerding out that mm -hmm. happens. And and we are all about kind of like nerding out because these the terms are they're they're there to help us make little micro distinctions between things. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really, really useful. So just to kind of recap this and then we'll jump back to your slides, we've got the idea of sort of flat, you're going to have equidistant petals. If it's cone shaped and it tilts, then you've got this, um, the ones that are on the side that is pointing towards you will be shortened. And then we have this uh, extra bonus feature of the tips of these have jaggies on them. 
And the jaggies are going to be an indicator of whether we've got ligulate bisexual flowers or female ray flowers. Is that right? Yes. Um, oh. And uh, I think this is a great, like once you learn to look for these things, um, we have some of the terminology and some of the uh, the highlights to look for. It would be fascinating now to like, not just bypass all the asteraceae that you see in the world, but to actually start looking at the flowers in more detail. And like, am I seeing like, I mean, some of these things could be open questions. You know, I don't know. What about ligul ligulate flowers? Would we find male parts? Would we find female parts? You know, like it's time to start tearing apart some flowers and looking at some of this. Um, it's a great starting point for questions. Wow. And I also love this, this, this thought of maybe those little grooves that are on it are sort of the edges of these petals that have all kind of come fused. Yeah. See, so, you know, that's an open question. I, I'm just looking at your photo and thinking, well, if there's three petals fused, those veins make it look like there's three petals fused. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, so uh, I got to get you for that distinction, Yve, about uh, the ligule. Yes. Yeah, so the single ray, the single petal on a ray flower is called ligule, technically. So single. the ray, the, the, the ray, ray is ray. technically a ligule. Okay, great, great. So these are ligules. And, and again, with, with the words, if, if, if all these were like botany, there's going to be a ton of words. If, if the words make you kind of go like, ah, I just want to kind of notice that there's differences there. That's totally cool. If the words make you kind of go like, ooh, yeah. like it's just kind of fun, <laughs> then if it helps, what, do whatever helps you kind of lean into it. Right. Why don't we bounce back to to more of your slides there, David? This is I'm Absolutely. so glad you're 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 doing this with us. Thank oh, you. Oh, this is fun. Thank you. Um, and I I like the like the the terminology is confusing to me, and I don't pretend like I understand all this. Like here we are discussing it, but it gives me little clues to look for in the world. Like it like now I'm going to start paying attention to these flowers more and trying to translate them into my own experience rather than just names on a page. I want to fully understand myself. What is a legal? Like, can I look at it and see it? And, mm -hmm. and then come up with my own descriptions based on my own experience. So. Well, and, and actually I should mention that David goes further than that. David regularly makes up his own terms, which, I mean, that's a whole other rabbit hole, which we could go down. Um, <laughs> but um, the, uh, you've, you've, uh, the, you 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 playfully, actively, thoughtfully um, uh, construct words as you are investigating as part of your 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 nature nerdy. Yeah. Well, while you're journaling, why not play with prefixes and suffixes and different spellings and old root words and stuff like that? Why not play with them in your journal and just mix and match? And no one's gonna ever read it, so just play and have fun is what I figure. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, um, grassicist. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the slideshow. I mean, what you were doing. What's one of your favorite terms that you've coined? That I've coined. Uh, oh, uh, vespertine hunterlet. Oh, whoa, vespertine hunterlet. Yeah, a bat. A vespertine hunterlet. Okay, that makes my day. I have to write that down. <laughs> Right? That's what it is. It's a Vespertine yeah. hunterlet. <laughs> it's pretty it cool. Is. It is. <laughs> uh, let's see. So we looked at these. Um, so I, I, I would just use this since we're here. We're still talking about the this strategy of packing all your flowers together. It's great for visitors who are coming um, and very efficient. Uh, another thing it's doing, and we'll see this when we see some of the cutaways of flowers also, is that it the most valuable part for the flower is its ovule. It's where the seed is going to form, the ovaries. Those are super valuable, very delicate tissues. And there's and, and because you're going to have a seed in there, there's going to be a ton of nutrients packed in there. And there's a lot of insects that want to just get in there and eat these fragile, tender little seeds. So the important thing about the, and probably one of the reasons this group is so phenomenally successful is because it, they tightly pack together all of their ovules into, let me I can even skip to that. So these tender white, whitish 
things at the bottom are the ovules. They're all densely packed together. And it makes it very, very hard for um, any insect to get in there and just cheat by nibbling away at the, the and cheating the pollination system and just eating the yummy nutrients in the seeds. So you're protecting them by packing them together. You can even uh, add at the base of the flower these extra, what are they, sepals or part of the calyx um, and all these hairs. So you can't really even chew into the base of it and like sneak by coming up from underneath. So uh, that's another advantage is you're packing together and protecting your ovules so that uh, uh, seed predators don't get in there and try to eat them. Um, and you also see in this picture too, that the corolla on each one of these disc flowers is very narrow and very small. The important thing is here that it's scaled to the size of the mouth parts of the visitors. Um, they're not flowers that are designed for insects to come and crawl inside of and get their whole head and their whole body in them. They are scaled to the mouth parts of the insects that are going to visit them, these very narrow little tubes. So it kind of is self-selecting for what insects come here also. Um, let's see. But um, if we go back to here, for instance, so these are some of the advantages, but what are some disadvantages? So one disadvantage is all of these flowers in this incredible field are, and each individual flower with many, many flowers packed together is an incredible concentration of food for insects. And so there are a lot of um, things like flies and beetles and moths and many other insects that lay their eggs on these flowers because this is a huge food source for their larvae to get into those flowers and start eating them like little caterpillars or little grubs. Uh, so that's one disadvantage for doing this strategy is you're packing a lot of food together and there are a lot of insects that want to take advantage of that by laying their eggs there. And it's like this beautiful nursery for their young. Um, another disadvantage of having your flowers packed together um, is that you're going to pollinate yourself. You have to have some strategies for avoiding pollinating yourselves. And sunflowers do this. Uh, I'm saying sunflowers now, but asters, composites. Um, sunflowers do this by having the part, the individual flowers mature at different times. And Jack's illustration showed that as well. But typically what they do is the outer ring, the ray flowers will, th these are female, will go through there. They will be receptive and ready first. Then the next outer ring will mature. Then the next inner ring will mature. The next inner ring will mature sequentially like concentric rings into the center of the flower. And they will first be male, and we'll, we'll show that in a second. They will first be male, and then the female parts will come out. And by separating in time and in space also, the male part of the flowering process and the female part of the process, you're greatly reducing the chances of pollinating yourself. And so here in this outer ring, you can see the towering styles or the stigmas now at the tip, uh, which is the female part, here in the next inner ring is going to be the female parts just emerging. And then in the center, these are going to be the male part of the flower process. And another advantage of this is that you have, uh, because it's a sequence happening over time, you have many different opportunities for different pollinators to come on different days at different times of day. And so you have many, many pollination events, which greatly increases the chances that pollen from another flower is going to be brought to you because you have visitors coming for different phases that happen at different times of day, different days, and for different parts of the flower. So it's a really great advantage. Uh, let's look at the... So well, actually, maybe we can bounce, bounce back there for, for just a second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, something that is kind of fun here is that on those ray flowers, I mean, the disc flowers on the inside there, you can count their petals. And how many mm -hmm. petals does one have? Mm -hmm. Everybody says, like, how many petals does a daisy have? People will say, like, oh, it's different numbers. No, but those are, those are flowers on the outside. Yes. Um, and here, how many petals? We've got five little petals there. So we're seeing, it's really easy in this view to kind of be like, oh, wow. Well, actually, is there one on the right-hand side of your screen that has four petals on it? 
Oh, uh, that might just be a fluke. But yeah, right here like this? Yeah. That looks like four, you're right. Yep. So uh. that's a great point. So when you say how many petals are on the balsam root, these are not petals. You don't count these and say it has, what, 10, 12 petals. This is really the petals here. This is the corolla of the disc flower, which is characterized by having reduced lobes, five reduced lobes in a fringe around the, the tube. Yep. Oh. And uh, we'll talk about this in a moment, but these are the corollas curled up and closed. They're enclosing the male part of the process. And then the female part pushes up through the center and pushes open the lobes that curl out. And then it just continues elongating up here in the outer ring where it's ready. Are, are, um, the, are the brown parts which were seen there the um, the 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 ring of of anthers? Yes, that's the anther tube. I'll try to focus on that in a second here. Oh, awesome! Yeah, because right. it's so cool. So the um, the strategy of having the male parts emerge first is called protandry. So I just spelled it out here because it's a tough word. Um, and some will, some flowers in the world will do the female parts first, but in composites, it's mostly protandry. Males come out first, spread their pollen, and when all the male pollen is gone, then the female parts open up to receive pollen from other flowers, and that way you're reducing the chance of pollinating yourself. Mm. So let's start with these ray flowers on the outside and look at some a little bit more detail. When we talked about these being female, you can pull them off. It's hard to imagine that these rays are actually an entire flower but they are when you pull them off you can see in the center this is the stigma coming up this is the receptive female surface coming up no male parts at all this is just mm -hmm. the asymmetric corolla reduced to three petals that are fused and then the stigma coming up out of it this is the female part so you would look at this and know that this is a what would you call it a pistolate flower it's just got the female parts um and then in the center, we looked at this already. In the center, we have the bisexual flowers, the disc flowers, which are both male and female. And let's see, let me skip to this. So if we go to this, you can see uh, oh, these are labeled one. here. So here's the, the five corolla lobes. The stamens are here in the center, the male part. And then out of the center of that, the five stamens or anthers fuse into a tube and we'll look at that in more detail in a second and then the female part comes up through the center of that and then opens out with the stigmas so <clears throat> oh that's cool so the, yeah. the 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 term well could we go back to that last one for just a second yeah. and is that pappus that is sticking up there is that something to help protect the little ovary, sort of be more pokey things sticking up at you if the if somebody wants to get down there and nibbled on the ovary. Yeah, it's one way of doing it. It's more uh, the uh, the the what are they called? Chaff, I think. Not the chaff. What's the term for it? Uh, maybe Avianus. There is another outer the brax. There's outer brax that do more protecting than the pappus. The pappus functions like this. So here is a. Um, dandelion very familiar dandelion so here is the pappus here this is the calyx of the flower reduced to a ring of long silky hairs and here in a dandelion you can see the so by, 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 by calyx of the flower that is i always get uh, it's a corolla mixed up calyx yeah is so people? this this would kind of be the calyx it's the outer ring is that right Yavea? The, the calyx is kind of the outer ring of bracts that protect the flower at the base or hold the flower at the base. Actually, from, from what I'd been, from what I'd heard, it's the pappus on the inside that are the modified sepals or calyx. And on the outside, it's just the, the bracts, the involucre. Yeah. Um, and the involucre bracts tend to subtend. Um, with the bracts, we're talking about things that are somewhere between leaf and sepal, not either one properly. It's more like modified leaf. And yep. in the case of bracts, they protect an entire group of flowers, yes. whereas the calyx is just for individual flowers. Yeah. So in this case, this is these bracts are protecting the entire inflorescence. But if you were to take an individual flower, what would be the, the, the cup that holds the flower, the calyx, is here reduced 
into just a ring of long silky hairs on a, on a little stalk above the seed. And then as it gets germinated and matures, those long stalks elongate and push the pappus up higher above the maturing seed. And then this receptacle that's holding all the seeds curls back and fans everything open like this. Uh, so the pappus. But go, go back one slide. I've never seen this view of a dandelion before. Look at that. Isn't that cool? Oh, and that's you, one step past you this. That bad boy open? So look how the look how the stalks, what's happening here is as it matures, the stalks elongate, push the pappus way up. Pappuses get pushed way up. And then when it's ready, the pappus is spread open as a parasol mm. to become the parachute that's going to fly the seeds off into the world. So that's uh, that's a function of the pappus. Um, you were asking about pappus here. They don't all there's lots of different ways of that pappuses can express themselves, and it's a characteristic of identifying different composites. But in the case of dandelions, the pappus spread open to this parasol that's going to lift the seed off in the wind. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. And then if we uh, look at, go back to the disc flower at the center, this is where the really interesting stuff happens here. Um, this is at a fairly advanced stage, and uh, this is a little bit complicated to to illustrate or explain, but what's happening is um, let's see if I go right to it. Well, we'll go to this. So these are all disc flowers. In the center, they're still closed, right? And while they're in an enclosed tube, the pollen is being distributed by the males, but the males are falling inside of the tube. So let's see. This is kind of hard to explain. But anyway, this closed tube, the pollen's being released by anthers, it's falling inside the tube. And then the female part comes up through the center of the tube. So here's like a little uh, cardboard tube. And the female part comes up through the center of it and pushes the pollen inside of it up and out. Um, and so here we have the closed tube, which is the male's part's gonna be shedding the pollen into the tube. And then the female parts push up and you can see at the tip of each female part, it's pushed the male pollen up and out. And then it gets collected by visiting insects. And after about two days, after all the flower's own pollen is gone, then it opens and becomes receptive. So here's a diagram trying to show some of this. So here are the closed things we were seeing in the center of the flower. Mm -hmm. These are the disc flowers. The little corolla lobes are closed over on the top. There's an enclosed tube. These are the anthers here. See all the little dots of pollen I put on them? Each anther is on a little filament. And in the center is the style, the female part going directly into the ovary at the base. And it's going to split and open up. But right now it's closed. It's just a closed, two, um, closed piston, we'll say. These anthers around the perimeter, there's five anthers. They fuse. So here we're seeing it in a cross section, but really they fuse into a tube. So we have five anthers that fuse into a tube and then five filaments that come down. They drop their pollen into the center of the tube. They go all over the female style here. When it's ready, the female style pushes up out of the tube. The corolla lobes open. The female part pushes up and exposes its own pollen the male pollen to visiting insects. And then when all of its own pollen is gone, then it splits at the top and the inner sticky surface collects pollen from another flower. I put it in a different color here. So that's pollen that now arrives from other flowers and, and pollinates the flower, cross pollinates it. Does that make sense? It's kind yeah, of complicated. These, these, these uh, anthers spilling the pollen into the, the center of the tube is such a weird strategy. Yeah. But then it does end up with all that pollen then presented in a little fun to eat, tasty treat, take me away nugget on the top. Yeah, not quite. Uh, so some it's interesting things happen here. <clears throat> so all this pollen gets sprinkled all over this uh, style that's coming up. 
and the style's coming up and it's dusted with its own pollen, right? Um, but it's closed so it can't pollinate itself. And then it sticks up out of this anther tube, which Jack mentioned was this uh, brown. This is the anther tube here sticking up. It sticks up through the anther tube, um, but it doesn't give out all the pollen right away because these filaments that are controlling, there's five filaments <clears throat> controlling the base of the anther tube actually contract and pull down the anther tube. <clears throat> and so here I pulled the flower apart. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's the anther tube. Here's the stigma now open. This one's pretty far along. The sticky stigma sticking out. And then there's the five separate filaments here. And then here's the corolla tube that I split and pulled it out of right here. Um, so these filaments pull down. And as they pull down, they pull the anther tube down mm -hmm. and they expose the female part intermittently. So when an insect lands on it, it triggers a contraction in the filaments. The filaments pull down and pull down the anther tube. And each time they pull down the anther tube, let's see, each time they pull down the anther tube, the female part sticks out and dusts the insect with pollen at the base. So th this is a touch response? Touch sensitive, yeah. No way. Yeah. Oh my God, that's so cool. So, it is so, so cool. And the filaments contract. But then they relax and go back to their normal position and then contract it the next time an insect comes. It only happens like three or four times. And in the meantime, the tip of the female style is sticking up. And like the eraser in this pencil here is like the, uh, the, the little dusting of pollen. It comes up and touches the underside of the insect and then pulls down again and then touches the next time an insect comes and touches it and does that. And then when all the pollen's gone, then and only then will the female part come up and the stigma will open. Uh -huh. And one other thing that you can see in this picture, which is so cool, is that, that this little female part that's coming up and pushing the pollen up out of the tube is actually tipped with a dense brush of hairs. So it's actually forcing all, it's scraping out all the pollen grains out of the tube as it comes up. And look at this picture. You can see the wire brush of all the hairs that are used to push pollen up out of this tube. So here's the tube. These are five fused anthers. All of the pollen went into the center of that tube. Then the female part came up and these two stigmas were first fused into one with wire brush on the outside. And they just scraped this tube clean, presented the pollen to the world. Then when the pollen's gone, then it opens. And now it starts collecting pollen. Here's a example of a dandelion with the female parts open and now collecting pollen from other insects. And you can see uh, down here, you can see the base of the pollen tube. Oh, no, the base of the, uh, not pollen tube, sorry, anther tube. The anther tube that the female part came out of here, right? That's, yeah, that's, so we're seeing the, the little anther tube there, then we've got, yeah. So I, I've got a, a question. The um, something that I heard from Patterson, um, and I wanted to hear if, you, if you've heard uh, if there's any kind of confirmation on this or if this makes sense. Um, let, let's see. Let me kind of join. Can I join you? Let's see if I can join you on screen here. Yeah, go ahead and I'll go away if you are. Um, well, I don't want you to go away. I mean. <laughs> Um, but uh, can you see me? I can see you. Okay. Yep. All right. So um, the uh, uh, imagine um, uh, I I I am I am the pistol, right? Mm -hmm. So I I'm I'm coming up through my little pollen tube, and then um, what what Patterns was saying was saying that that at the top this the so it it opens up and it's sort of receptive if there's if there's any pollen stuck on still stuck on the outside of it its receptive surface is now this this open thing like you had in your diagram mm -hmm. and so happily it gets pollinated but but he was saying also is that if it doesn't then these two branches i'm going to now sort of turn mine around so that, that it kind of came up like this they they then continue to curl around and then touch down on themselves to try to pick up some of their own pollen 
if they don't get externally pollinated. So the, yes. you, uh, have, have, have you heard, of, uh, does, does this make sense? Yes, and I, I, that, I believe that's what's happening. So you can even see it, let's see, I'm looking for a good illustration. In this one, so this is what it's doing. It's already matured. If it gets, if it gets pollen from another flower, then it, everything dries up, it's done. It's, the seed is germinated, it's ready, or not germinated, what's the word for it? Fertilized, it's done. Things are gonna dry up and desiccate and fall off. But if it doesn't get pollen from another flower, it's gonna continue to curl open and eventually these stigma will come down and touch its own stamens with whatever pollen is left and pollinate, pollinate itself, right? And that's not ideal, but it's better to produce seeds and come back the next year and try again than it is to not be pollinated and just you know lose a breeding season. So yes, these, these receptive sticky inner surfaces will continue to curl open as they grow and grow and grow like very hopeful, where's the pollinator, where's the pollinator, where's the pollinator, oh, okay, I'll touch myself, I'm done. <laughs> so, that's, so that's what they're doing here. They're touching themselves and getting their own pollen as a backup strategy, right? So all this... so here, ideally, they want to be visited at this stage, yeah. get pollen from somewhere else. So but these can... continue to curl back and mm -hmm. touch themselves at some point and get the pollen grain that's left on the stock that they didn't get that didn't go somewhere. So ideally get cross-pollinated and if that yeah. doesn't happen, then I touch myself. Yeah. I mean, wait, no, uh, let me rephrase that. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, 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 I curled out and touched my own anthers and then, and so I'm, I'm, I'm able to clone myself then. You but, clone yourself. Uh, um, but that's better than not reproducing and losing a whole breeding season. It's better to come yeah. back with yeah, some yeah, yeah. seeds. Another thing uh, where we're talking about these touch sensitive filaments is that um, they can actually detect which side the insect has landed on and lean the disc flower preferentially towards the presence of that insect. So there's five, five filaments that are pulling. They can pull slightly differently and angle the the disc flower towards its visitor. So I think that's pretty cool too. That's ridiculous. Yeah. I, 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 want, to, I want to get a little camera down in here <laughs> and, and watch this business going on. Yeah. Oh, see, at this little level, there's just such mm -hmm. cool stuff happening here. Yeah, here you can see the stigma is open, but really, let's see, at an earlier stage, I think you can see this in your on your computer screens. These are like little pistons that poke out and push out, and you can see all of the cluster of pollen mm -hmm. at the tip of each one because mm -hmm. it's pushed up. It's pushed up through its own pollen source, and it's all sticking to the top, and that's where it wants the insect to touch as it comes in. So each one is like a little brush that's pushed up through the anther tube and is sitting there with a bundle of pollen waiting to be touched. And so I think that's just really cool. Boy, it just makes you think like all, all this kind of elaborate mechanism, just mm -hmm. how in, like just a, such pressure to get better and better and better systems for pollen delivery mm -hmm. and, and, and reception. Mm -hmm. this is While also avoiding uh, pollinating yourself with all these flowers massed together. <laughs> You have to have strategies for that too. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yep. So, so if we're looking at this, I am seeing on that outer ring some of the the, mm -hmm. the, the, the those double those little wide those sort of antenna looking stigma. Then mm -hmm. on the inside of that, there's another ring, like you're saying, of just that column with mm -hmm. a little yellow nugget on top. Are those little yellow yep. nuggets, bits of pollen that are just waiting to be snatched? Yep. And then in the center, they're early. They haven't happened yet. Not and mm -hmm. um, there's no intermediate stage here, really, because it really happens in one morning. So each ring is going to... So you could watch this pretty quickly, because in the morning, that style, I think the right term, yeah, style is going to push up, push the corolla lobes open. And so it's going to go from this kind of closed state to this open state in the course of one morning. It happens very quickly. 
And then they're going to stick up like this for about two days until all of the pollen is gone, then they'll open. So you could sit and watch a flower and return over the course of even two mornings or one morning, and you could journal and watch a lot of this happening. I, and your idea of putting a camera on it would actually work. You could probably do a time lapse over the course of a morning and document that opening. Well, it I, 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 also, I, I want to get a little micro camera down there and watch these little guys, the little filaments retract. I want to, that would yeah. be fun. You know, or, or just over a series of days, have somebody like bring you sandwiches as you <laughs> sit back there with the flower. <laughs> <laughs> or just change your diet to flowers and just sit and nibble on flowers. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, and I have a, I have a lot. I didn't. It's hard to capture this in uh, photographs. I have a lot of video clips of uh, super close-ups of these flowers with dozens and dozens of pollinators walking around inside of it, mating and finding each other, and covered in pollen as they walk around. So there's really a on a good day, there's a whole community of insects inside of this walking around and staying warm inside the the little, the cupped Corolla that you drew inside of there where the heat is concentrated. Um, so it's just going to be really buzzing with life in there. And as they're walking around, they're covered in pollen and they're moving from flower to flower and and then it can fly to the next flower and stuff. So pretty interesting. So uh, let me, I'll just, I mean, I don't, have much more to say i'll just end with a pretty picture and then we can we had a lot of great questions and comments i don't know if you want to do any more drawing at all um so i'll just kind of like stop the talking and and hand it over to you or to yabea for discussion and um does that sound good um uh, so yeah, let's maybe just bounce a couple of questions here so marcelo's uh, uh marcelo it's great to, to see you here again uh thank you so much for being here um, so, um, asking you about, um, your thoughts on the sort of female flowers in the outer rim, um, is this because insects will land there first, bringing pollen from other flowers? Um, any thought on? Yeah, I think that's a great point. I don't know if it's a question or observation, but if it's an observation and it's brilliant because, if an insect's going to land on a flower, let's say here. So is it going to land in this thicket of protruding columns? No, it's probably going to land on this broad runway and then walk in or crawl in towards the center. And as it goes, it's going through this thicket of receptive female parts as it moves inward, right? Mm -hmm. And probably... That if there's going to be nectar, they're supposed to produce a lot of nectar. It's probably going to be in these just open ones in the inner ring. And that's probably the goal is walking through this thicket of these receptive female parts to get to the more lucrative pollen stores in the freshly opened inner oh. ring. I've never thought of that, but I'm just thinking out loud right now. That's probably what's happening, right? <clears throat> so this is the landing pad, one of these big broad surfaces. And then you will want to get into the inner ring, whatever so the freshest inner ring first is. First through all the, where you could be finding the female parts and then later ending up with all the male parts in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's like a grocery, it's like a grocery store where all the candy bars are at the front of the store by the cash register. Oh something. yeah. Those are, these are on the ends of the aisle. Yeah. And the, and the vegetables are in the very back of the store. Yeah, I don't know if that analogy works, but <laughs> it's all about presentation. So I think that's a that's a really great um, that's a great comment. I love that. And then, um, then what what also do you, are are you aware of any UV patterns in these? Yeah, they would have UV patterns. Sure, that's a great. That's, I mean, yeah, uh, there's definitely uh, some color things. I didn't dive into this. Um, but there's going to be different UV patterns in the center and then the outer ring. It's like imagine an oxide daisy, which is has white petals with a dark center. So it's like it really, and if, especially in a forested area, a more shaded area, it's going to really pop out this big white disc with a brilliant UV spot in the middle land here. So that's really clear, I think. 
Yeah, I've seen some um, um, photographs, some UV photographs, where, yep. where there is a, it looks like a perfectly white petal, and mm -hmm. then there's that the part of the, sorry, ligule that is right next to the disc flowers is super dark in UV. Yeah. Oh, yep. oh this is fun. And, and again, this is, this is your backyard now. Yeah, actually, uh, I live uh, right on this, right in here somewhere on the slopes of this mountain right here. Um, and one, oh, I, I kind of keep jumping to this one because one thing I was thinking of is that a strategy of generalist flowers like this is that they don't have strong scents. They don't need to invest the energy and the resources into building the chemical floral smells to attract pollinators. They're doing it visually. Um, so they, the characteristic of generalist flowers is that they have very mild scents. But when you walk in these fields, they're quite pungent. Um, and it's because of the lupins mixed in here. Mm. So it makes a nice mix. So you're walking through these fields, it smells good, and there's just insects buzzing everywhere. It's it's intoxicating. There's it's it hits our senses on ways that are kind of beyond rational thought, as you can imagine. You just can wander in fields of this stuff for hours and just be in a daydream. <laughs> uh. What else should I have done? <laughs> what else should I have done with my day? Yeah, that's so good. Yes, and of uh, course we're going to do a we're going to do a field sketching class here next spring, right? <laughs> um, I, I this is I, I think that's a a, a great a great idea. Um, so if folks would like to come up and and uh, I, I would love the opportunity to 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 be in the field with you again. Yeah. Well, not, a, not no more beautiful spot than this. So did we end up with any more questions? Uh, I kept seeing questions and comments in the chat that I was trying to keep up with and they were fascinating. So maybe I should stop the screen share or keep it up in case there's a question that I want to illustrate. Um, um, yeah, why, why don't I, I'll, I'll share something, just sort of one other kind of drawing note in this. And then let's open it up to questions, comments, thoughts, and ideas from everybody in the show. Mm -hmm. um, David, first of all, thank you for this 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 nerding out. It just sort of reminds me of how much fun it was to be uh, with you in the field. Yeah, likewise. It's fun though, just riff off of these things. I love it. Thank you. So, let, um, and, and again, I want to encourage. Let's uh, put David's website into the chat. There's a newsletter sign up there if you want to kind of get in on these. Um, uh, notes from the field. You also have a, another one that is specifically kind of little note, local observations of things that are happening in your 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 yeah. area. And this might be a model of interest to other people too. So um, I started a Facebook group for my local community. You know, we're just an isolated valley in a r remote rural area. People kind of love the natural world. So I started a Facebook group where people could post photos and questions and observations, kind of like you do in this group here where people are talking to each other. But in a remote rural area, just simple people living out here. <laughs> and I have like over 1,900 people in the group now that post every day, like what they're seeing. What is this? And oh, my God, the, the flycatcher showed up today. Oh, my God, there's a robin on a nest. You know, it's just. People are sharing incredible things every day, and it's become an incredible forum. But there's a lot of people that hate Facebook. So I started another newsletter so that people could follow what's happening week by week here in the local landscape. So this is something someone could do anywhere, wherever you live. If you want to create a focal point for your community, the Facebook group has been a great way to do it. But then the newsletter is a, a fascinating extension of it because in a newsletter, you have a permanent resource. You can put identification guides. You can put in-depth articles. It's always there on a website. Um, and then every week, I just do an update. What happened in the natural this in the natural world this week? And I don't even have to create the photos. I just pull them from the Facebook group and then add them with some text. And this becomes a permanent snapshot of what happened this week in our neighborhood. So if people want to check out that example. It's at um, MetownNatureNotes.com. And you can see the newsletter. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and that's the name of the Facebook group to Metal Nature Notes. Um, so anyway, it's it's just a, a, I mean, it's a cool thing to look at, but it's also a great model that other communities could use as well. Um, a note in the chat from uh, Amy, uh, who's pointing out that 
um, self-pollinating yourself is different than cloning because you still are kind of rearranging um, your, 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 your gametes there. Um, so not quite the same thing as just sort of making a copy of yourself. Hmm. You're making a scrambled egg copy of yourself. Hmm. Is that true? Um, uh, so hopefully yeah, okay. The uh, I see a lot of heads nodding. Yes. So oh, yes, interesting. Yeah, I use cloning loosely, but yeah, you're right. I love that. I think I think I I, I said clone, and so mm -hmm. I think I, I planted that. Um, information into our conversation. A, I can take a couple of issues of I uh, go in my newsletter, the Lucas Guides newsletter. I focused on what's called the bud bank, and it actually turned like we think of the seed bank, where everything's throwing seeds out and the seeds wait in the soil, and then they're available for a new season to grow, whether it's the next year or you know de decades later. The seed bank is like a pantry of seeds waiting, but a, a really prominent um, uh, ecologist came up with the idea of the bud bank. And there's way more plants in the world that are using a bud bank and that are reproducing with their buds. They're sitting in the soil waiting to grow out and cl clone themselves. So cloning is on my mind. Um, so it's a fascinating article where I looked at what the bud bank as an idea. I won't go into it here because it's never irrelevant. Heard of that. I mean, it's, yeah, I didn't either. This, it's this, this really, world, but, the more we kind of dig into things, um, uh, like Susan Beckhart, uh, is, has been making some comments in the, the, the chat here. You know, she loves to, to like find some little corner of the world and dig in there. And when, yeah. whenever we do that, inevitably it's more rich, beautiful, and, and, and inspiring and complex than we could have possibly imagined in every little corner of this world. Yeah, yeah. Ah. And then events like this, where we all meet as a community and chat, uh, just become opportunities to geek out and nerd it out. I mean, like I spent two days reading scientific papers about asters and focus on asters in a way I've never thought of. And and that's a great, I love it. What, what a great intellectual exercise. What a great way to spend two days of my life is just thinking about asters, going out in the yard, pulling flowers apart, looking for the pieces I was reading about, get, taking photographs of them. It, just like a beautiful, rich two days that I learned so much that I will always remember now. So Thank you, Susan, for mentioning that too. Just poking into little corners of the world. And yeah, just, you know, and then those seeds go floating out, germinate, and then Esther is born. <laughs> More questions? Uh, Someone had a hand up, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, or let, let me just sort of, uh, sort of show one thing um, over here, and then we're going to drop into questions. Um, boop, 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 boop. I'm going to share this. Uh, back there and <laughs> here we're gonna go so i just want to say something about um some of these um some of the 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 leaves here um mm -hmm. because if you are out there sketching sort of zooming in on the um zooming in on the 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 shape of the flower is cool but what's also cool to take note of I want to encourage people to do some habit sketches. Um, you know, for instance, do you have um, a, a set of basal leaves and your flowers are popping out above that? Um, on others, what you'll see is you'll have some basal leaves down here. And the flowers are nestled down in here. So when you look across the field, um, you're seeing a bunch of the flowers are actually obscured by leaves that are in your way. So kind of a fun thing to add to your, your, your sketchbook is that you might think of like, oh, I'm going to do a close-up of the flower. I'm going to do a little diagram of what the leaf looks like. Oh, Jack, I'm sorry to interrupt you. There's a request that you might zoom in a bit, please. Ah. Okay, they're not very detailed drawings. You'll get zoomed in and you'll go like, oh, <laughs> that's what you were drawing? <laughs> yeah, so um, so kind of where are those blossoms in your di diagram relative to the height of those leaves? I think that that's kind of a, a useful, what, what we call these a habit sketch. What is the habit of this plant? And kind of getting those into your journal as well 
are a really useful thing to do. Um, next to the habit sketch, you can also just put a little line showing how many, how many, you know, let's say this was three decimeters tall. Um, how what the the heights of these are for for ones that are or sort of bigger shrubs and things you make some of those diagrams another thing you could do is just make a little stick figure of yourself you can put a hat on um give yourself a little notebook i think you have to lower just a little so we can oh. see the hat sorry yep. cool um, so these little habit drawings are a very useful addition to the kind of notes which we take. Mm -hmm. And um, the final thing I wanted to do is just, if you're kind of doing some of these studies, getting some sketches of the leaves is really helpful. And I want to think of that in two different ways. Um, one is sort of a leaf diagram. So if I'm looking at you know, these leaves here, I've got these leaves that have, look at that, I'm gonna get onto the screen before I start drawing. You can zoom out maybe again, if it helps. Uh, All right, so I could do a little um, drawing that, that shows that this is sort of roughly a arrowhead shaped leaf. And then also put in, um, let's say this was 23 centimeters. Um, and on one side of it, put in little notes about the direction that you see the, the, the veins going. Um, this is a useful way of recording information about what you see. Um, but it is, it's not, um, sometimes we also want to make more of a, a portrait of what we're seeing in these kind of flattened leaf shapes. Another thing you could do is even um, put your nature journal down underneath the bush and bend a leaf over, trace around the edge of that leaf and you get the leaf shape. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you've got that thing loosely traced out, and then you can sort of draw over that to make it a more kind of confident, bold sketch. But tracing over leaves, uh, uh, putting a leaf down and kind of loosely tracing around it, remember, as you press in on the leaf, it's going to move the leaf. So what you're doing as you're tracing around it is you're just making these little kind of light marks so that you're, you're not really going to push that leaf. That's a useful strategy. The final thing that I wanted to say on the leaves is that sometimes they're doing leaf yoga. <laughs> and this is a visually, when you first hit these, it's a, it's a visually very confusing thing to, to draw. Um, but I just wanted to show you some hacks and ways around that that I think you might find useful. So I usually start with um, kind of a, a very light colored pencil, perhaps my um, non-photo blue pencil. Um, and I'll block in my basic shape of it with this and then draw over that. That's not going to work on this screen because this camera doesn't pick up the non-photo blue pencil really well. So I'm going to show you what I would kind of do with that light pencil, but I'm going to use this pencil instead. All right. Um, so the first thing I, I, I do when I'm draw, trying to draw kind of a complex leaf shape like this is just get the overall proportions of this. How long is that leaf? And I put this in lightly. And then how wide is it at different points? It's going to be roughly this wide here. It's going to get a roughly this wide here. So I'm just putting in a few little marks to kind of help me kind of get that basic shape. Then, this is my kind of widest point. How far in does that little indentation at the end go? This end here is roughly an angle out to there. We're then going to come down 
to a fairly blunt tip. And on the other side, I'm seeing the same thing. So you notice I don't have any of the wigglies, the little curves in here. I'm just kind of getting this thing loosely blocked in. And now I want to get uh, start kind of having more fun with it. I've got veins that come off here. And so I'm now starting to draw a little bit more, more darkly. And then these, the green parts of the leaves are popping off of that vein. Well, that's cool. I definitely want to have, have, have that um, in my thing. And what I'm going to do is as I just sort of bring my pencil around here, I'm going to just let it dip into some of these spaces. And your brain is going to think that the dips are going to be doing this. But very often, a dip will have a gentle side and a steep side. And so I want to kind of don't expect that the in entrance and the uh, exit of a dip are going to be the same. So let me kind of just kind of come around here and I'm going to go out and then I'm going to go in with a symmetrical dip. And then it really helps to look more at the leaf than you're drawing. So here's an asymmetrical dip. So it's going to curve down to a little scoop up. And we're going to curve down. We're going to go up. And then look at that dip. It's coming down, and then there's a flat bottom to it. You're not just seeing, you're not seeing the edge of the leaf coming down like that. You're seeing one edge of the leaf come down, and then you're seeing part of the leaf roll over like that, and then the other part of the leaf coming up. So there's this, this cool little dip here. I'll make mine a little bit longer. Now, this next dip on the two dips on the other side are these are the ones that are going to be these are the your two money dips right here this one in here and this one over here if i get the shapes of those ones right it's going to be a really cool looking leaf so this edge of the leaf curls round and i'm just going to initially follow the edge of the leaf it comes up towards me it swings around down here and then slowly comes back up to the height of this. And over here, that top edge, it comes up. Then it changes angle. It's going to come down and curl there. And that should have been moved over there. Well, I'm just going to live with that. So what I did is I drew the, the shape of the far side of it. Then I'm going to have, I want to look at, so actually let me kind of come in here with a, <clears throat> I'm going to start to draw a little bit more heavily over this. I'm coming, my leaf comes, I've got a dip. The dip curves around, it's going to come sharply back from that. And up. So I want to try to get this shape. And then I'm putting this back. I want to look at what direction does this backside go? Where does it point towards? And then I'm going to just strengthen this line a little bit. And that makes this line be a little bit further back. A few other things that are going to help is I'm going to put a few little kind of contour lines back here to sort of show this, how this leaf is curving its angle. You see those little lines? Let me zoom down on those three little lines. Whoop. Oh, it's not wanting to let me do that. Let me try to do this without having my camera. So what I'm going to do is I have 
these little lines like this sort of help sort of you sort of see the contours of that surface that is down there. Um, let's just do some of these uh, moments that are this little line comes down and what I did is my line comes down breaks dots dots. So there's a little kind of a little stutter in my pencil down here. That suggests a little ridge that comes down and then it peters out. And let's do this little ripple over here. I'm going to come up then change angle down. Really look at this negative shape here. There's this, when I'm looking at a negative shape, I am looking at this shape, the shape of the air underneath it to get these angles. And then I am seeing suggesting that that goes off there. Now from the top of this dip here, I have a little bit of a swoop down into the plane of the leaf. That can cast a little shadow in there. And on this side here, I have the same thing, but I'm not going to come from here. This is kind of swooping up towards me. So I have a little bit of a line that is, so I'm not coming, it's not, I'm not going like this. It's actually, this other line is coming in somewhere back here. And then on this side of that, I'm going to put in a little shadow. So those are just a few thoughts to help you get a few parts of this leaf that will make kind of drawing those kind of fun ripply parts a little bit more interesting. This little one here needs a little shadow in there too. That helps, it helps the leaf wobble. Um, so in addition to fun flowers, we've got some really cool leaf shapes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and with that, let's go, um, Let's go back to uh, the the group here. Does uh, if anybody's got a question, comment, thought, or idea for Don Lucas? Um, I see please. Walter's hand. Ah, right. We've got a hand up. Um, yes, I see Walter's. I will spotlight him. Oh, great! Walter's glad you could be with us. Hey there. Hi. Hi. Uh, very nice to see all of you. Hasn't have. I haven't been here for like two months approximately, um, but I'm back and I wanted to ask sort of a general question about two weeks ago, I think it was on National Geographic social media pages, they were saying that California has had a super bloom and I was wondering if that's all over California, for example, where you live as well, Jack, or is it closer to like mountain meadows and in the mountains where uh, where uh, Lucas lives? Hmm. Or is it like widespread all over California or is it concentrated the bloom in these uh, more uh, meadowy places in mountains or I don't know, I'm not that well with California too. Well, the fate of California right now is that the mountains are still deeply covered in snow. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, the uh, because not so California is a long state that goes north south. Okay. And the result of that is that when we get our bloom here, it starts in the south and then it ripples towards the north. Okay. So for, uh, okay. Um, I for I think it was I would think it was like two two weeks ago, and it said yeah that like there have been I don't remember that well, but maybe because of rains there has been a super bloom, and since that hasn't been like this since like for five years or something. I don't know. Maybe that's false. Maybe I'm saying it false, but I just no, wanted no, no, to no. ask if that's no, no, true. No, you're, you're right. So the, um, we'll, we'll get these sort of patchy blooms. So in one place it'll bloom, in another place it won't be. Um, different places are, are, are getting blooms. Um, I, with all the rain we got this year, kind of ended our drought where we're officially out of a drought in you know, where, where I'm sitting. Um, I was thinking this is going to be my year to go to the desert. And I, um, over our kids' uh, uh, school break, we, we disappeared to Mojave and Death Valley. And I was thinking this is going to be, this is going to be this super bloom there. And um, it, uh, it it's a very strange year. It was, there was very little in bloom when we got down there. I understand that things have gotten better. Here in the um, in in this part of the West, uh, this is a, a a website that is really really useful um, for a lot of people who are trying to catch a super bloom. It's called Desert USA, and um, it has these different sections for different parks. Um, and so, for instance, you can pick on. You know, let's see what's happening in Joshua Tree National Park. I can get there. So, and, and it gives you the little bloom a meter. In a full on super bloom, this is going to be bouncing up at 10. But right now, this is about four out of 10. And then here are photographs from different, um, different folks um, from different areas. And you see that they're all sort of date stamped. Um, so they'll say that this was April 20th. And then they'll say where it is, um, and uh, that helps people kind of get these sorts of things. Let's see. I want to see what's happening in Death Valley if it's gotten better than. Oh, see, so yeah, right now Death Valley is. Um, but still, there are some nice flowers out there, but in there, it's not a super bloom. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Had, I thought. Yeah, I thought a super bloom is something that occurs occurs all over the state but uh so it's on so it's in occurs only in specific areas that's right okay yeah i got it yeah the weather's been really strange this spring up here as well for example back in latvia where it's more up to north where i am at the moment it's much warmer than here and uh the weather has been going crazy in the eastern part of Latvia. We have been having even some snow in start of May. And the western part is plus 24, 20 degrees Celsius. So it's really, really strange this year, I feel like. Really strange uh, weather. Well, our, our climatologists have been telling us that one of the things that's going to happen is that weird weather kind of uh, global weirding uh, it's, it's what you should expect. Um, um, overall, average temperatures are going up, but that mean, doesn't mean that in local places it can be colder and colder longer. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of the um, one of the sort of strange effects of an overall warmer climate is more extreme weather. So that mm. means that there there will be, um, uh, that there there will be you know places that are locally you know having you know you know these cold snaps that they didn't expect, um, more water in places that were drier, more dry in places that were water. So we're going to get more, um, sort of what we have kind of come to know as the average typical weather in a place is going mm. to be in for some serious disruptions. Mm -hmm. yeah no that's for sure yeah
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank it's you. great to see you again, Vultures. Um, oh, it so really is. Your, your winter season has come to an end. Yeah, um, I'm back from the Canary Islands. Um, now I'm in Venice at the moment, uh, but I'm going back to Latvia in a couple of days, and it's good. It's good to be back. The birds are returning, and just like two weeks ago, uh, I I uh, got my personal ringers or bird banners license. So up until then, I was ringing, but with an expert by my side. And now I can, uh, I have purchased mist nets on my own and I already already have caught a couple of birds. So now I can uh, start doing my own research. So pretty exciting stuff going on. Very cool. That is really exciting. Congratulations. It is. Thank you. Congratulations. That's a lot of, 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 of practice and, um, and training that goes into that. Um, I'm really, really uh, proud of you. That's fantastic. I'd love to bring on um, Ann, Tim, uh, Ann, sorry, Ann Chadwick from Point uh, Blue Conservation Science, where they also do a whole bunch of bird banding research. Um, I, I think Ann probably also has uh, some thoughts about, isn't it cool to see um, uh, young avid uh, ringers stepping up to the plate here? Absolutely. Congratulations, Walters. I'm so happy you. for you. That's terrific. Thank you. And I know a lot of work went into that. So great job. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's it's super fun. Just the just the thought of that by putting it on that one small metal ring and bringing back something to bringing something to the uh, science community uh, about how we understand how birds migrate, how their behavior and that sort of stuff. And right now I'm just practicing and not doing any specific research um, but uh, throughout summer uh, so for my uh, last exams in biology which are happening next year I'll need to do a research project and I'll probably use uh, the nets and ringing to do something there so so will be fun will be fun that's hey, great. if there's anything that we can do at Point Blue to help you out, because, you know, we have our whole Palo Marin field station and bird banders or ringers, as you call them, there, yeah. and um, lots of interns and apprentices and people who are maybe just one step ahead of you, so they could probably give you some great advice, and I'd be happy to. Oh, thanks, that would, be, that would be awesome, yeah. I'm still, yeah. as I'm still new to my own nets, I'm trying to find good locations, good times, you know, it's all pro a process of learning, but uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's going to be a good adventure for sure. Thank you very much. That's, that is really, really exciting. And, and, you know, should you, um, I know that Point Blue also has uh, research projects globally um, that might be interesting to, 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 uh, do you have Anne's uh, contact information? Oh, of course I do. Of course okay. I do. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you know. And maybe uh, I was looking actually I was looking through your website if you have any volunteer uh, any volunteer opportunities. As I will probably be taking a gap year to do volunteer jobs or internships. So. I'll let you know uh, if uh, if it looks like I could be coming to your side. So that we'll would see. be fantastic. And I'll let you in on a secret. We're trying to put together some art and science um, projects as well. So we, knowing your artistic abilities as well and nature journaling chops, I think you would be a great candidate to get that underway. So. Please stay in touch on that, and we'll Wait. see what we can work out. Yeah, should okay. you find yourself in this part of the world, um, we will we'll come together and 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 hook you up. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. I'll definitely let all you know. Thank Fantastic, you. Fantastic, Walters. It's great, great to, to see you. you again. Great to see you. Bye. And isn't that exciting? Wow. Fantastic. I love to see that. But I knew Walter Walters was going to make it, uh, you know, make it big. So he's just 
just launching and it's going to be a great takeoff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, Walter, so also, should you come this way, we're going to have to uh, run around with our nature journals in the, the, the woods and do a whole lot of playing. There's a bunch of people here that would love to just uh, hang out. So, uh, uh, we'll, so more, more to come. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have uh, questions, comments, thoughts, or ideas, journal pages to share? Oh, good. Susan, I was hoping that you'd uh, could bits in on this. Uh, when we were talking earlier about somebody, uh, oh, and uh, thank you for the email about our rabbit hole investigation. Um, we really want to get that going. So um, you can now unmute. Hey there. Hello. And my, my friend over here, I have some turkey over there, and he is over here. And he's being very polite. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, th th this was so fantastic, and I just, I love, I love the idea that some scientist somewhere has got one of those, one of those things that measures like the vibrations in the Earth's surface for earthquakes, and they just saw a big spike on there, and they were like, "What was that?" And somebody says, "Oh, don't worry. Jack and David are doing a class again. And that was the sound of forty-seven brains exploding all at once." <laughs> 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 yeah. This this is great. I did have a question. Um, I was just was thinking about the the uh, that this whole discussion of the the, the ray florets and and ligulate florets and all those things. And I so I, my my favorite thing is to like think think about like what's the rule for a plant and then find a plant that seems to break the rule. I don't know because there's always exceptions. But so so one of the many many fantastic asteraceae that we have right here, um, we have spotted knapweed, which is quite invasive but very pretty, and the butterflies love it. Um, but I was always, I've always been sort of curious about that because it does look, Vea knows, I've pestered her about questions about this before, but it does, it does seem to have a sort of, I know it's an Asteraceae, it does have a different sort of structure and I couldn't find a good picture. So I tried to kind of sketch them, something from memory. So any inaccuracies are due to me. But what's interesting is that I would have called these the ray florets, but now I'm thinking, I guess maybe they are ligulate, ligulate florets. Mm -hmm. But, um, it's got you know your sort of center um, disc florets and the little little stamen guys up there, but then these guys are actually a tube. It's like a corolla that then opens up and you have these you know five. And I think it's five. I need to go check when they're blooming again and just to confirm that. But I, it's certainly more than three. I think it's five little petals coming out. So does that mean that that would likely be um, ligulate florets then? I don't know if that's clear enough. Yeah, I think I think I think you're right. I'm looking. I'm googling f photographs of spotted knapweed flowers. They look like they're ligulate flowers to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just interesting because yeah, it's like it's um, yeah. I always sort of wondered if that was if there were. Excuse me, this one here is being. But yeah, so I'm just always always curious how that had all looks out. So yeah, I think I'm guessing next time I see one, I'm going to have to dissect it and go see if I can see what kinds of naughty mm -hmm. bits it has on the inside, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, and see if I can figure that. But yeah, so that yeah, that was that was great. Um, but uh, yeah, so don't don't have a, a whole lot of um, uh, more nature journal uh, work to show because I've just been very busy with the end of semester and things. But I do have to show off though. I have been I've been getting more involved with like community mm -hmm. science at the Albany Pine Bush. And just most recently, I finished up the Woodcock surveys. And I got myself a shirt to celebrate. Oh, I, I, I like that, that, that sound. Me. 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 <laughs> so yeah, so for the last for the last couple of weeks, I've been going out in the in the evenings right after sunset and just going out and listening for me. 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 <laughs> and then and then yeah, yep <laughs> can't, can't see him out there in the distance but i had to basically go and like try and count how many how many i can hear which is real difficult when they keep moving around but um but yeah and then you can see them do their 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 courtship flights they fly they they fly up and uh you know way way high up in the sky and their wings whistle and it sounds a bit it sounds a bit like um uh, like a morning dove when they they fly and their wings whistle, but it's but they're different different family. But yeah, and their wings whistle and they go up and they said they go way high up in the sky, so you can't even see them. And of course, it's around sunset, so it's, it's, it gets very dark and very hard to see. And then they spiral down, and they and they made more whistling was the 
all these great noises and they come land right in front of the girl who hopefully is impressed and i figure if a man was going to go to that much effort to impress me i'd at least give him a look so you know i, I think that's fair but yeah so i've been uh, having a lot of fun with that so oh. so i have, haven't been getting a whole lot in the journal lately but i but i'm gonna intend to now that i'm done uh recording that uh that information i intend to go out and do some more sketching and, and see what they're doing and and now you've got the t-shirt to prove to uh, exactly exactly so i can i can that, that's good can we see the shirt one more time okay. <laughs> so the the official that, that's the official transcription in my very official um data uh from the um in fact i can show you right here from the um U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Canadian Wildlife Service North American Woodcock Singing Ground Survey. Oh. Um, you have to record the number of the number painting. So painting is the very official term. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, this is this last day. It was only one each place, but yeah, there have been more. So, oh, that's really fun. That, so, that's, that's, everybody, so, so <laughs> Walters, I hope you're having an awesome time. Doing preventing. Everybody should get involved in community science wherever you are because it's super fun and you can learn lots of things. <laughs> Absolutely. You can go down rabbit holes and contribute to uh, our sort of larger understanding of the world. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. You definitely can. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank you. <laughs> um, hey there, Kate. Good to have you with us. You can now unmute and we're going to bring you into the spotlight as well. Hi there. Hi, I haven't seen you for a while. Um, I drop in today. Good to see you. Uh, yeah. Uh, how are the horses and how's your journal? Well, the horses are great. Um, definitely have a whole hobby farm going out here. Um, Timber's doing really well. We did our first unofficial search and rescue last weekend um, and we helped haul a dog with two broken legs out of the woods. Um, so he's doing great. And then um, I have a whole garden going, about a fourth of an acre. So that's starting to produce a bunch of food. So that's pretty impressive. Um, and yeah, so all the you know plants and animals out here are doing great. Nature Journal got a little bit neglected, but I've been working on trying to get back into doing more drawing and painting and all that fun stuff. So a few pages just from fooling around. I start bringing the journal outside more. I'm, I'm uh, going to move uh, the spotlights for myself and David to make your journal yeah. bigger. Um, oh, fun. Yeah. Trying to learn how to draw some bugs. It's kind of a weak point for me, so I was trying to do a bit more like that. And then, as you may know, I have that salamander project that I'm doing with uh, Parker Gibbons, and the salamanders are really evading me right now. I'm trying to figure out how to Kind of stylize the salamanders in ways that, um, you know, they don't look so cartoonish, even though they do look cartoonish in real life. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> the the, the, um, the the they have a solidity to them. They 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 feel like they have dimension. It might be those costal grooves wrapping around sort of as contour lines, but these really feel solid to me, which I I like a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that actually really helps with that. Um, but just trying to figure out what the style to do that in to really show off their features and all those things. And um, yeah, so I'm doing quite a bit of that. And I'm just trying to put in more pencil miles because mm -hmm. between work and just trying to keep my head above water with doing, you know, all the other things. Well, let's let's see here. that, that croc head, that, that, so a few pages. Uh... Oh, yeah, I saw one. Now. I think. I don't know if it's an like alligator no, no, crocodile. Uh, um, oh. or, or sort of go the other way in the book. Yeah, right, right where your fingers are. Right where your fingers are. The, your, uh, nope, the other way. Uh, other way, no, no. The, yeah, yeah there, there, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing a little crockhead poking out. Oh, yeah, there we go. Oh, or <laughs> that's fun. Yeah, that was when I, so it's about a year since I went on my trip um, down south with my friends. And so I was kind of going through all those photos that I hadn't had a chance to mm -hmm. draw off of. And I was um, kind of redrawing some of the stuff and seeing like what new techniques and stuff I'd learned and um, what it was like looking at those now and trying to draw from those. So, oh, yeah. These have, I, uh, 
this, these, these really uh, have dynamic poses. This feels great. These really feel like solid birds. Bonded himself with the cactus. Oh, we got to get you out on get... the road trip to inspire a whole nother journal. I know. Well, there's so much stuff in the yard too. The only problem is that when I go out in the yard, um, I go, oh, I should, you know, go scrub out the chicken's water. And then I end up doing that. And I think I should be more intentional about going outside and nature journaling or even just bringing in some, uh, you know, botanicals and stuff like that to draw off of. Um, so I got one of those neat little tools that you showed us. Oh, yes. Week. Yeah. Aren't those little handy yeah. hands things fun? Yeah, that's a great tool to have. But yeah, I'm just trying to put more energy into my art and you know, I mean, last year I had, I think, so, you know, I took basically a year off to kind of recover from some uh, mental health stuff that made me take a break from school. And I just threw everything I had into as many pencil miles as possible. And I was filling up a journal a month with just tons and tons of sketches. And um, I'm trying to bring back at least some of that energy to keep moving forward. But um, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's great to see those those little uh, those salamanders going. And you were considering for a while a scientific illustration program. Is that right? Yeah. So I tried doing the one from um, Yale online. And the thing is, I was really struggling to invest in the online class because for work, I spend, you know, 30 hours a week sitting in front of a computer um, at the vet's office. And I just I could not bring myself to spend any more time just yeah. intensely focused like that. I just did not have the energy. I think it's an in-person class, but it's a bit more like, you know, energy from other people and stimulus and stuff, but just trying to focus on those classes, I just, I couldn't do it. And so now I'm kind of, I'm thinking about going back to uh, my university and trying to do, or trying to finish up my major but then move it from environmental policy to like visual science communication and see if they'll let me throw in some art classes into it and just see where things go because I'd love to do the Monterey program. Um, I don't know if that would be financially viable or even viable with, because I want people who have a like science degree. Oh, um, no, no. You, know, you, you, you would rock that. So you would be, and you need letters of recommendation yeah, we'll see. So if I can find, if I can figure out how to finance that with some scholarships and stuff, then that would be the ideal one, especially if my parents live in Monterey. Um, so who knows? But I was trying to figure out the best path for without burning myself out again, because that's yeah. kind of the, good, good the main for you thing. For moving away from that screen when you figured out that that was just not a healthy direction to go. Yeah. So the only screen classes I take are yours because. I think the mistake that they made with all the other classes I've taken is that they don't engage the community so much. And so there isn't like this amazing life force behind it, which I've always felt with your classes. And um, it's just so much more easy to, en to engage when it feels like it's really just alive and a community-based thing instead of something that you're just sort of watching. Uh, there's there's a lot of great content out there, but we are a social primate, and we mm -hmm. we love to kind of interact with each other. Um, oh, absolutely. And then we can also pick David's brain. <laughs> yes, yeah. David or Susan, Anivea, I mean, there's a lot of great brains yeah. to pick in this community, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank thanks you. for letting me share. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and that, uh, let, let's see that, uh, that, that alligator one more time, that one in the back of that, that last one there. The, um, so putting, kind of going bold, think of how scary it would be if you were, had your drawing of this alligator. See, now I'm going to put it in the water and to mix up darkest, darkest, grayest, greenish thing and putting that in as your watercolor. And then thinking to ourselves, like, no, water is blue, water is clear. Um, but this really works. And notice how it also kind of pops those, that little highlight right around its eye uh, on the far side is a really important one to pull out. And uh, because the light's hitting that and pop, giving you contrast against that back, it really is working. Thank you so much for sharing all this.
Right. Um, so now let's go over to the UK. Ray Bonto, um, you are live with David Lucas. It's great to see you again. Hold on. Now you can unmute. Uh, hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Oh, fun. I'm going to uh, uh, minimize our screens so we can make you bigger. Um, oh, yeah. Yep, some really good sort of structure studies there. That little bit of curling leaf over there as well. Mm -hmm. And this. There's the leaf. Yeah. Yeah, finding a, a, a curling leaf. Oh, turn the, the, the there we oh. I don't know how that happened. It, it's trying to erase your 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 paper. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh there we go. There we are. Yeah, yeah. I also like your line weight. Notice how Ray Bonto has on the side that is closest to us a heavier line that really visually pulls that side of the leaf towards us. And that line coming down the middle of it, having that be uh, also lighter, there's a, there is a what I call a hierarchy of information in these lines. There's a hierarchy of line. There's bold, middle, and light. So bold on the side that's closest to you, that pulls it towards you. Um, middle on the rest of the outline, and then light on the details uh, in there. That really helps you sort of see uh, the, the, the structure on that leaf. Well done. You want to say anything? Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. And Arpan, good to see you. Oh, hi, Jack. I phone to your email. Sorry. Oh, oh yeah. And and we'll we'll be in touch soon. We'll, we'll we'll sort of see what we can do so that when I come over to uh the UK, I I would love to in any of my spare time, just try to connect with the two of you. Um, that will be my, 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 my goal between when I land and when um, my, um, my workshops, work, workshops start. Um, and hopefully we can, we can make that work. It would be great to, to, yeah. to see you in person. I will, I will let you know on the email. Yeah, it's a little bit far, but I think uh, it's the only chance Ravonto has to take your life class. So I think uh, we should register for the class. Excellent. Thinking of it. Yeah. Oh, I, I would. Oh, I'd love it if we could um, hang out there to to together. We'd also let's find some downtime there. Also, should should that should that happen, um, I would be really delighted to yeah, to be with you. Um, Thank you. Absolutely. Um, great to see the two of you. Great to see you, Jack. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Spotlight. Hey. So, um, uh, um, David, are there um, are there any um, other uh, things that are kind of uh, going on in, in, in your part of the world, things that you wanted to make people aware of um, from workshops, online opportunities to do things with you, live opportunities with, uh, uh, with you, or are you working on any new books? No, the, my, all my effort right now is going into the newsletter. Doing a newsletter is almost a full-time job. Yeah. So I got to figure out how to monetize that and the, uh, just really ramp that up. So that's that's my primary focus right now. Actually, there's two newsletters. Um, uh, and then in the winter, uh, I think uh, Yvea mentioned it, but I do the Nature Nuggets videos every week. I do a different nature video, um, but those take a lot of work. So I'll probably pick those up again in the winter. Uh, so that's what I'll be doing. The summers are for hiking in the mountains. I'm, it's only a few miles away to get to the high alpine meadows and stuff. So that's the time to be there. I only get a couple hours a year. It happens so fast. So, yeah. yeah. And, and this also really does raise the, the, the point about for us as a community to find ways of supporting um, people who are kind of contributing to the, the, the community in the way that you do. 
Um, it's possible to make donations on your website. Um, is that true? Kind of? Not yet. Not uh, yet. Oh. Right. No, I haven't set that up yet. Uh, like right now, the newsletter is free. I'm just trying to just bring joy to people's lives and uh, and just get that ball rolling. And then at some point, I'll put up a way to pay. But right now, it's just... Uh, the, um, I, I would strongly consider you uh, encourage you to consider putting up a way for people to just be able to make donations. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of generosity in this community. Yeah. Um, and for instance, the work that I do is primarily supported by donations from uh, yeah. participants and, and viewers. Yep. And um, the uh, uh, we we have to figure out a way of making this kind of connection sustainable, you know, sustainable for 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 you in the long. Yeah. Term. Well, right now, just creating the newsletter is just, it's, I'm just building that out. It's a lot of pleasure. It's a lot of fun. So just, you know, being able to communicate with people every week with a new nature story is just a joy right now. And, um, it's, and it's free for everyone right now. So at some point I'll make, I'll, I'll have some extra content for people that want to subscribe at a little bit every month or something. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you. This has been a lot of fun today. I really enjoyed doing this and being part of this conversation with everyone here. And uh, uh, my newsletter comes out today. So if you do subscribe, you'll get it today. Um, and I'll, I'll do an article that does a deep dive into what we talked about so that you actually have a permanent written thing of uh, what we covered. I'd like to add the link to this talk to the newsletter too. So really grateful to you for um, phoning in from uh, Washington yep. to yep. Um, give us a little bit of uh, insight not just on uh, Asteraceae, but on how your brain sort of thinks and makes connections. I want to yeah. encourage people to, oh, yep, <clears throat> to look at L Lucas' books right there, um, Language Making Nature and Sierra Nevada Birds by uh, David Lucas. David, you also have another book um, that is specifically about birds of the San Francisco uh, Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Bay Area. Bay Area birds out of print, but there's a, you can buy the, what do you call it, ebook on Amazon, which is even more useful, I think. You can have it on your phone everywhere you go and just go right to the, the account. Excellent. Yep. Thank you all. And to all folks in our community, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank um, you. Um, Susan, Kate, Walters, Anne, it's uh, Ray Bonto and Arpan. It's great to see all of you. Thank you all for being here. And um, we really look forward to playing with you again. Stay curious, be kind, and let's take every opportunity that we can to go out and celebrate just being alive in this wonderful world. I think Kate really gave us a, a wonderful reminder of... Uh, you know, that realized that it just wasn't healthy to spend that much time behind the screen. Mm -hmm. And um, stepping away from the cathode ray tube is a really important part of self-care.